It's, you know, Art Files, Blender, Polyhaven. We're doing concrete floor and tiles onyx. And this is all about physical-based rendering, PBR. So, quick overview, recap. Let me go to my notes. Object mode, again, is for placing objects and moving them around. Edit mode is for changing the shape of the geometry. Now, this is critical. All right. If you do make transforms in object mode, have a good night. See you at the senior show. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I'm just gonna go G, Z, move this up. R, X, 45, to rotate it 45. All right, so I'm in object mode. I did some transforms. This is critical. Whenever you're doing this, Control A, apply all transforms. If I did not apply those transforms, when it came time to texturing, I'd be screwed. Okay, because the computer can't do the math. But once I do apply those transforms, so I'm going to undo that. So I'll do R X 45. I'm going to hit the N key. I'm going to go to my item over here on the side. Here's item. Now you look, it's saying, hey, it's 45 degree rotated and we moved it on the Z. Okay, can everybody see that right there? Now watch what happens if I go control A, apply all transforms, it's zeroed out. It kept the transforms, but now the computer's saying, okay, you're zeroed out. It knows where the zero points are. That's why you'll run into issues because even though you move stuff around, you got to clear it out and reset it. Okay. That's done with control A and then apply all and whatever transforms, whatever you're using. So that's half the battle right there. So I'm going to hit X to delete. I'm going to make another cube real quick and just a quick editing mode recap. So I hit tab to go to edit mode. I'm going to deselect. One is your vertice mode, two is your edge mode, three is face mode, and of course, you can select something E to extrude it. You could scale it in, E to extrude, you could scale it out if you want, however you feel like it, and then I is your inset. That's for like making window frames and things like that. You could also extrude it inward from there, okay? So that's basically what we started on. Then we started on bevels and chamfers. Chamfers, I'm gonna hit two for edge select, control B, and I'm gonna drag with my mouse. The default without any segments, that's a chamfer. It's a 45 degree cut. If I click here, control B, I can drag, make my chamfer, then mouse wheel to get my segments. That's a softer bevel. Everyone see how the lighting changes based on those? Okay, chamfers and bevels are examples of what's called planar shifts. It redirects the light. It also adds some highlighting to your detail and shows off your model better. Uh, oh, and then lastly, before I forget, was I'm gonna hit tab into edit mode. Control R is your loop select. You can either go horizontal or vertical and mouse wheel will make multiple loop selects. I'm gonna set two, left click to accept. If I do S and then I'm looking at my Z axis off my gizmo, I can spread them further or closer apart with that scaling on the axes I want. So that's a quick little recap on what we've done with modeling. All right, I'm gonna delete this and this applies to what you and I were talking about. Shift A, I'm gonna add a monkey head. Okay, Shift D is duplicate. And when you duplicate, you're duplicating the mesh and all the geometry information. And that's when things build up. So I'm going to go look at my gizmo X. So I'm going to go shift D, slide it on the X. And I'll look right here. Suzanne, Suzanne, that's my mesh data. Suzanne one, Suzanne one. I've got new mesh data. This is twice the geometry because I duplicated. So this time I'm going to make an instance. So I'm going to go alt D and I'll hit X to slide it over. And look at the difference. I'm going to twirl down. This Suzanne's the original, and its mesh is called Suzanne. This one's the duplicate. It has a duplicate mesh. My instance has a different name, but the same mesh. So I'm saving processor speed, and I can have a more complex scene using instances as opposed to duplicates. So I'm going to hit X to duplicate these. 
So let's try with uh, the idea I had. One second. Uh, just got to update my. OK, everybody's there. OK, so Adam is going to Alt D duplicate. All right, so I've got two of them, but it's the same mesh data. So what you can do for this, let's try this. Remember, I is set your keyframe, insert keyframe. I, now I'm going to do rotation. I'm going to move forward, and I'm going to say, let's try R, X, and then we'll go like that. And remember, it's orange. I hit I, now it's got a keyframe. So my first keyframe, it turns yellow, and if I make a change after I move the playhead, it turns orange, and I have to change it. So that was X. I'm going to make this one Y. So I'm going to hit I on my instance, do rotation, and then I'll move my playhead backwards, and I'll go R, Y, and I'll move that, set my keyframe. Now let's check it out. See? Two separate types of animation, one mesh data. This would only render, you know, it would render a lot faster because it's only one piece of geometry it's referencing. Make sense? So instances, if you're doing like trees or leaves, do it once, instance it, you'll save on your processor and you'll, you'll render faster. Everyone understand that little recap? All right. Now it's time to kick it up a notch, which is what we always do. So I'm going to teach you a little trick that's new tonight. We're going to go Shift A, and we're going to create a cylinder. And here's our little review panel. If you want more geometry, get out of here. I'm going to be fine with this. OK. Now, if I were to scale this or rotate it, apply any transforms, I'd want to apply those transforms, but we're doing this in edit mode. Uh, first, I'm going to actually rotate this. Uh, let's tilt a key to change to a side view. Now I'm rotating only on one axis. Remember, if you hold down control, you can snap it to 45 or 90 degrees, like such. All right, now I'm going to control A, apply my transforms. All right, here we go tab into edit mode. I'm going to teach you a new modeling trick. So you learned a couple, you know, the basics, extrude, inset, loop cut, bevel, chamfer. Okay. Now this one is bridging. All right. This will save you so much time because tonight we're going to work on making a photorealistic subway staircase. Okay. And this is going to be our railing. So I'm going to show you the technique and then you're going to be like, oh, this is a lot easier than I thought. 3D is a snap. I'm using the cylinder because it's the closest shape to a, a handrail on a subway. Okay? And I want to, you'll see. I'll go to left view. All right. Now remember, if I select this, I'm only selecting what I see. My x ray is turned off. If I turn on x ray, you'll see all the geometry I did not select. Okay? So you want to be in x ray mode. And you want to have all your geometry selected. That's the first step. Any questions on x-ray mode and making your selection? And I just did a box select. OK. So I made a cylinder. I rotated it. I went into edit mode. Everyone ready to kick it up a notch? Sure thing. All right, here we go. I'm going to duplicate this cylinder in edit mode. So it stays part of the geometry without making a second one. OK, so I'm going to want to go on my Y. I'm looking at my gizmo up here. So I'm going to go Shift D Y. And I want to make sure I'm on a side view and I'm going to rotate this to about the pitch that the stairway railing would be. And I'm going to move it down a little bit on Z. Look at my Z. So I'm going to go G to grab Z right there. And I've got two pieces of geometry in this one object. Everyone with me so far? I just duplicated it in edit mode. And you can do that. And you look up here, it's one, it's one object with one piece of mesh data. All right. Here's where edge loops come in. I mean bridge edge loops. I'm gonna rotate my camera a little bit.
this face is selected. I clicked on the little dot right there. I'm going to hit X and delete that face. Now it's hollow. The face that's pointing to that one, I'm going to face select. X, delete face. I now have like two empty soup cans. Do you see how they're, the faces that are facing them are empty now? Everyone got that? Yeah. All right. I'm going to hit two for edge select. I just did a teeny tiny selection. I'm going to turn off my x-ray. When you want to get an edge loop, that's all the uninterrupted edges that are joined together. You hold down the alt key. So if I click on that edge, I've got all the edges that are joined together. So that gets the whole loop that's open. I want to do the same thing over here. I want to get a whole edge loop, but I got to hold down shift so that I add on to the selection, just like in Photoshop. So shift plus alt. Now I've got both edge loops of the open faces selected. Everyone good with edge loop selecting so far? All right, here's the new part. I'm going to join these two together in geometry. So here's how you do it. Right click. And it should be bridge edge loops right here. I just right clicked and got the bridge edge loops. Now I'm going to click one time in my review panel. If yours doesn't pop open, click the twirl down. Number of cuts. Look what's happening. Now we've rounded that off without having to do that modeling. It did it for us same number of faces on each of these objects, and we created a curve. You could do whatever you want. You could adjust the smoothness to get the look you need. And remember, you can always right click, reset, default value, twist if you need that to happen. That's how you do it. Like if you're doing like a lampshade or something like that, just do some edge loops with a twist. Merge factor, you won't really mess around with. So I'm going to reset that. And you could choose different types of loops, but I'm just sticking with open loop and your profile shape. So basically, I selected both of those loops, right clicked, bridge edge loops, choose the number of cuts. You want something nice like that, and then click off like such. All right, I'm going to tab out of edit mode. And there's the beginning of our railing. All right. I just had two cylinders cut off the faces and bridge the edge loops to get that curve. That's a fast, easy way of making curves between objects that have a similar number of faces. I'm going to right click auto shade smooth. There we go. Everyone good with that? Now, there's one more thing we got to learn. And I'm going to tap back into edit mode. I'm going to I'm going to close this face just to make my life easier. So I'm going to select that edge. I'm going to hit F to fill that creative face for me. Let's find out. Hit three. Yep. All right. I've got a face. All right. I'm going to E extrude this and see how it's carrying along the same angle that it was facing. That's the uh, that's your normals that is facing. I can do the same thing up here if I want. So I'm going to hit two. Select this whole edge. F to fill. Select the face. And I'm going to E extrude it back. Now at the beginning of this, when we we're doing our intro to, and I just turned off my overlays right here so I don't have to look at all those extra lines. I was talking about shading issues. When you've got a flat surface and a round surface meeting, you can get some shading issues. You can also get shading and texturing issues having faces that are too long. See, these are really, really long as opposed to here. I've got more geometry because I'm going around a curve. So when that happens, I just use loop cuts. That's control R, mouse wheel to get the number of cuts I want, left click to accept. I could slide them back and forth at this point or just left click to accept them there. That's going to be better shading because I've got more geometry. I'm going to add a little bit here, left click, left click. There we go. And I need to do the same there, but in the interest of time, same thing, control R, left click, left click, control R, mouse wheel, left click, left click. Now I've got more geometry. So when I texture it, 
it won't look weird because it's got shorter faces. They're roughly all the same size. When you've got long faces like that, you're going to have shading issues, as we've discussed in the past. All right. Any questions on bridge edge loop? OK, because we're going over it again once we get to texturing. Here we go. Now, tonight we're doing PBRs, physical based renders, photorealistic materials in your scene. And the fastest way to do this, let me hide this. There we go. You gotta have the add-on installed. So whenever you need to add an add-on, you go edit, preferences, add-ons, and I had you add this on at the beginning of the semester, but uh, just to make sure, it's called Node Wrangler, and you click the checkbox to make sure it's, you know, it's on. This one's already checked on, and save and load when you're done. Node Wrangler will save you a lot of time with your node trees, and it's just an invaluable tool to have, so I strongly suggest you turn it on when you're using Blender are located right here. So in Canvas, Files, Art Class, Art Slides and Art Files, Art Files, then the Blender folder and Polyhaven. We're using Concrete Floor and Tiles Onyx tonight for these physical based renders. Now, we're gonna start setting up our subway scene. Uh, we basically got our railing, but I'm gonna create this again. So I'm gonna delete this, X, delete. Okay. Our subway hallway, we're gonna start off with the cube. And we're gonna scale this up a lot because it's part of like a building. GZ, let's move that up. See, snap it to the ground by holding down the control key. And I don't need to see the floor anymore because that's distracting. All right, so now we're gonna think about this. We've got a stairwell. So that means we're gonna want an open face here and this is gonna need to extend out, okay? And I told you before, when you do rotate and scale and all that, you should control A, apply all transforms. And additionally, once you start editing your mesh and you've got a texture on it, it's going to get messed up. So you're going to need to reapply the UV projection of it. And I'm going to show you that. I'm going to start off wrong and then we're going to fix it and then you'll see how it goes, okay? So remember, we're starting off wrong so you can learn how to re-project your UVs, okay? Normally you'd plan it out, you'd model it, then you'd texture it. So we're gonna do a little bit of modeling, a little bit of texturing, then fixing it. Everyone okay with that? Because I'm showing you mistakes you'll make as you're learning, and this is just a fast way around them. All right, so stairs are gonna be over here. Tab into edit mode, three for face select, get rid of that face, we don't need it. And this is going to be our landing right here. The stairs are going to be over here. And uh, good evening. And I've got this all recorded so you're not missing anything. Stairs are going to be over here. We can cut out that space right now, actually. So I'm going to do Control R. And we can do two loop cuts. Yeah, let's do two. I'm going to click to accept, and I'm going to want to scale it. It looks on the Y, so I'm going to hit SY. Yep. Now it's a bit more of an opening. That's exactly what I wanted. Okay, good. And then there's going to be where the stairs come from. So I'll hit three for face. Uh, e to extrude. And then we could do GZ to move this up because people are coming down the stairs like that. We're going to add more onto this, you know, but first I'm going to say like, there's going to need to be a big wall over here, but we'll do that later. Cause I want to start having some mistakes so you can see how to re UV map. All right, so this is the very basic intro to our hallway. I just did a loop cut and I deleted a face. Everyone go with that so far. All right. Now our point like this in the scene, let me go into rendered view right here. 
There is no light. Okay, we got rid of it. All right, that's fine. So I'll just add it back in. Shift A, light, point light, move it up a little bit. This could be like the light inside the subway tunnel. All right. So I already did control A, apply all transforms. What I need to do next is go to edit mode because I changed the geometry. A to select all that geometry. And then I'm going to wait. A to select it all. I'm going to hit the letter U on my keyboard for unwrap. Now I'm going to choose smart UV project. So every time I change this geometry, I'm going to need to go in, select it all, smart UV project it again. So I'm going to do that. And I'm just going to click with the defaults, hit OK. Now, once we throw our photorealistic render material on here, it's going to look pretty good. So I'm going to go into my rendered view and we'll do our little intro to Node Wrangler. All right. That's wireframe. This is solid. This will show materials and this is rendered view. Rendered view will show you lights and textures that you've applied. So I'm just already going to rendered view so that I can see the Node Wrangler with the physical based render. Um, so I already downloaded the materials. I'm clicking right here on my corner, I'm going to go to my shader editor, click new material. I don't want this side panel, so I'm going to hit N. Here is how Node Wrangler works. You must click on the principled BSDF shader. You have to. There's two settings from Node Wrangler that everyone uses. The first is control T. If I hit control T, that will add an image texture, mapping, and texture coordinates. Okay. This is great for doing like noise textures or you know, just placing in a quick image. I'm going to hit undo. That's for doing a simple image. No trees can get very complex, especially when you're doing physical based renders. That's why this is such a valuable plugin to add on. It's the Node Wrangler add on. So I have my principled BSDF shader. You saw control T will give you mapping coordinates, texture coordinates, and an image. But to do a full physical based render, you do this quick command, control shift T. And that does a pop-up window. I go to where my material is. I'm gonna go back one just so you can see what it looks like. Here it is right here. That's what we downloaded, Tiles Onyx from Polyhaven. So I'm gonna double click to open. I don't want the previews. I want the regular folder. I'm gonna double click to open regular. Whatever image resolution your files are at will be different. This one's 3K resolution. Double click to open that. Each one of these does a different thing, like displacement, glossiness, normal map. You need all of them, reflection. I'm going to click all of them by, you know, holding down shift and selecting the top and bottom one. Then I'm going to click principled textured set right here. Now look at this node tree. Would you want to have to string all that together and place all that? It does it for you. Okay. Any questions on control shift T while selecting the principled BSDF to add your physical base render PBR texture. Okay. So now we're going to look at this more critically because that's what you're here for to be artists. This scale is way too big based upon the room that it's in. Well, that can be adjusted in the mapping node. So texture coordinates, it's UV set by default. You're usually going to use UV or object or generated. Those are the three big ones. We already did a smart UV project, so I'm going to stick with UV for now. Scale. If I hover over, left click and drag down, I get all three axes at the same time. And I can say, oh, this would be smaller in real life. So let's try five. Five's way too small, so let's try three. Three's the happy medium. One was too big, five was too small. That's about right for subway tiles. Everyone agree? So, you know, you could do it non-uniformly, see? But I'm scaling them all uniformly. Everyone good so far? No? 
All right. And like I said, I'm recording this so you can go back and look at it as many times as you need. All right. Now, anyone has any questions, now's the time to ask because I'm going to teach you something new because we're always here to learn. Everyone good? I want this floor to line up perfectly with the subway stairwell, okay? So here is how you can have one object with two materials added. We'll have the tiles for the walls and the floor here and the floor up there is gonna be concrete, all right? To do that, all you have to do is go to edit mode with the object selected. So I hit tab or you can go up here to go to edit mode. And I'm gonna have the number three for my face that I want. It's gonna be this face and that face because of the geometry cut I did. And we'll do that one right there. I have them selected. Everyone go with that so far? All right. Going to my materials panel. These are all the different properties panels icons. This one's for materials. This one is our subway tile. I'm gonna click the plus button to add a new one. I'm gonna click new. I'm gonna name this as no confusion. I'll call this floor. Everything I want selected, I already have selected. I just click the assign button. Now, when I go out of edit mode, there's no tile there, okay? So I can do another physical based render, PBR texture for the floor. So I'm going to go here. Let's see where my nodes are. Okay, I'm just zooming in and out. There they are. Now remember, for Node Wrangler, click on the physical, I mean the principal BSDF. Control T will just do mapping, texture coordinates, and an image. We want the whole node tree. So we're going to hit Control Shift T. We're going to go to where we saved that, and it was the concrete floor. Yours might be different. And again, you don't need the text file, but you need all the images. Hold down shift to get them all. Click principal texture. And there's our concrete. And again, that's too big. So I'm gonna adjust the size in my mapping node right here. There's my scale. I hovered, left clicked, and let's try three. Let's try seven. No, try five. Five's all right, yeah, like that. I can live with five. So now we've got one object with two different textures. Everyone good? Any questions on that? All right. Now, it is time for the Socratic method. Because if I just talked all the time, you wouldn't learn anything. I want to make stairs that join up with the floor. You've learned loop cut, extrude, inset, bevel, and bridge edge loops. Which would you try first to make the face of a step coming down from that floor? Think, yes. Extrude? Yeah, that was right. Extrude. Very good. Now, this is a plane. I'm going to tab into edit mode. I'm going to hit three. See, it's a face. Okay. I don't want to extrude the whole face. I'm going to do an edge. Edge select up here, or you could hit the number two. That's the edge I want. I want this to go down. That's my Z. So I'm going to hit E, then Z extrude it down the length, like the height that the step would be. Let's say about there, okay? Now we're not done. I need the step to come out in this direction, which is Y on my gizmo. Do you see how I'm always using the gizmo to know what direction to go? It's invaluable and it saves you so much time. So E, Y, as far out as I want the step to be, about there. Eh, a bit more. 
so I'll go G, Y to grab it, make it a little bigger. There we go, I'm happy with that. And I'm going to click off. So that's the beginning of my first step. All right, everyone good? So here it goes with kicking it up a notch. I'm gonna press three for face select. I'm gonna click the height of the step and the width of the step. If I press the letter P, as in penguin, separate selection, what this is gonna do, everything that I have selected will become a separate object. So I'm going to do that. Well, why would I wanna do that? Okay, so let's name this. This is our hallway. Let's make sure, yep, double click. There's our hallway. Now what we just created is our steps, all right? I'm going to go back to object mode. And before I do that, I'm going to go to edit mode. I'm going to press A to select all, U to put my, un my UV mapping. I'm going to choose smart UV project and stick with the default. And look at that, that fixed up that. Now let's make this a little bit smaller. Yeah, okay, I like that better. So now we fixed up our texture before we move on. That's the benefit of smart UV project. I gave you an introduction to the array modifier. When I add modifiers, I do it in object mode. I'm in object mode. Modifiers are the blue wrench right here. And we're gonna add an array. If you don't see all your modifiers, you can mouse wheel up and down to see more of them. Okay, so let's look at our gizmo. We need to go Y and Z. So I don't need the X, I'm gonna hit zero. Y, remember one is a full unit of measurement. And Z, one is a full unit of measurement. I say how many steps, let's do 13. There they go. Okay, now let's try Y minus one. There we go, let's do Z minus one. Now they're going in the right direction. One is always the whole size of that unit that you're moving. So if this was three feet wide, one would be three feet wide. Do you get it? So we just said we want to go on the Y and the Z, and we created our stairs. Just like that. And let me see if what happens if I add a solidify modifier, just while I'm here, just for curiosity. So I'm still in modifiers. Let's see, solidify. Let's see if we can add a little depth to it just to. Now they're a little bit thicker. All right. Let's stick with that. We'll see, we might get rid of that, but I'm gonna tap back in edit mode, U, smart UV project, that's okay. Yeah, that solidifies really junking up the texture, so I won't do it. All right, save. And I'll just save this to my desktop because Blender crashes from time to time. Any questions on anything we've covered tonight? Okay. I've got this wall over here that I made when I made my stairwell. And I can take that. So let me go back to object mode, select my stairs, I mean the hallway, tab to edit mode, three to get that face. You know what, I can probably, let's see. I'm gonna do the edge again, just for the fun of it. So I'll go two for edge get the edge, we'll go E, drag it out. Oh, no, let's go to side view. Why, okay, sure. And then I can take this other edge right here and I can go E, Z. Now we've got a back wall. So I'm gonna go 
back into object mode. Well, actually, no, I'm hitting A, select all, U, smart UV project, and see that fixed our texture. So when you keep adding geometry, you got to keep projecting it. But we needed this stairwell to have a wall so people don't go falling off of it. Make sense? All right. So that is your introduction to PBR, physical-based renders. Now we're going to work on procedural materials with the handrail. Procedural, excuse me, procedural materials are a bit more complex. So let's see, we're right here. I'm going to hit save. And actually I could end the rent, I could end the lecture here. And oh, there's my light up there. Let me delete that light. And uh, real quick, We'll be covering this in the next class, but there was a question earlier about EV versus rendering in cycles. Um, right here, the camera, the back of the camera icon, this is your render settings, your render engine. You got EV, workbench, and cycles. Workbench is just for like animation, just to get a rough idea of the motion if you got a complex scene, but most of the time you'll be in EV or cycles. So to show you the full difference between the two, I'm going to, uh, let me set up my camera. That's with my tilde key. N to pull up my view. You can mouse wheel up and down if your side panel's too much, too cluttered. I want to lock camera to view. That's right here. Now I can use my mouse wheel to zoom out and my hold down the middle mouse to pivot, hold down shift to pan and zoom. Okay, let's say this is our, I'm gonna click off to zoom in a little bit. Let's say this is gonna be our final rendered scene. I'm gonna add in an HDRI light so you see the difference between Blender and, I mean, Evian cycles. I encourage everyone to get this plugin. I think it's, it is free. Um, the add-on is Easy HDRI. Okay, I already have it loaded up. Otherwise, you'd have to create a node tree in the world. Uh, I'll, I'll just do that real quick, sure, fine. So there's the world settings, use nodes. I'm already in my shader, right here, the shader editor. I'm gonna go from object to world. I'm zooming out with my mouse wheel. Okay, now, this is gonna be a good example of an instance of when you would use just Control-T with Node Wrangler. So I've got my background selected, Control-T, and I just choose my HDRI here. Uh, I'm gonna use I'll just do a Photo Studio just for the fun of it. There, color, okay, fine. And let me try cycles. Okay, so already you're seeing the difference here. I'm gonna do a brighter HDRI, and this time, I'm gonna get rid of this node tree. I'm gonna use my easy HDRI. Create world nodes, I just click right there. Remember, anytime you see something pink, that means an image is missing. So I'm gonna click my folder to load it up. This time, go to my HDRIs. One of the benefits of this is once the HDRI loads up, you can uh, click here and see different ones. that and let's do our render engine difference okay here's Eevee 
look at how unrealistic that is. There's no shading from where any of this stuff meets up. So first I'm going to turn on ambient occlusion. I'm going to turn on bloom and we'll turn on screen space service reflections. And we're still left with a pretty junky image. I mean, you would need to do a lot of stuff to get these shadows to behave properly, okay? And believe me, for me to show you all the settings you gotta change, it would probably take me two to three hours to show you. You can do it, but by the time you make all those changes, you're gonna render it about the same time as if you did it in cycles, okay? So it's six of one, half a dozen of another. But look at the difference when I jump from EV to cycles. That shading is now correct and the reflections are popping up in the tiles. It's just got that heightened sense of realism. So that's why, oh, and when you were saying, with your scene where I was saying do instances instead of duplicates, right here, cycles, default is CPU, GPU compute. It's gonna speed things up immeasurably. Another thing you can do to make sure if you if you have this grayed out, you go edit preferences because GPU compute is very powerful and it's worth this extra step. So if yours is grayed out, go to system, not add-ons, system. Optics right here is the best one. Optics are Huda and you do not want to turn on your core processor, you want to do your graphics card. So for both of these, I could choose NVIDIA. I'm going to stick with optics, NVIDIA turned on. That's why I'm able to select GPU, okay? So whenever you need to do, hit save and load when you're done. That's the first step. Second step, performance, right down here. Use auto tiling, click that on, set it to 400. You'll render a lot faster. So you got a smaller tile size, and it's thinking of less of the scene, okay? That's under performance. If you're doing a still image, it's okay to have these clicked on, okay? This is part of the AI denoiser. It only works well with the still image because if you animate it, you're gonna get flickering and aliasing, and you're gonna to need to use deflicker in DaVinci Resolve, the paid version, to undo that. Now to speed it up, you could change this from 0.1, well actually the default is 0.01, but yeah, go into like 0.1 or 0.2, and you lose some of your light information, but it'll render a lot faster. You could also lower your sample count. The high samples work with the AI render uh, denoise, but once you turn this off, you're going to want to turn this off. Light paths, this is something you decrease to increase your render, to speed up your render time. The total number should be the biggest number here. Like if I want to do, say, six glossy, six, six for diffuse, six for glossy, transmission, let's do like eight. There's no volumetrics in this scene and nothing's transparent, so I'll knock that down to two. My highest number is now eight. So you always want your total to be equal to or higher than the highest number that you chose, okay? Setting up your lights and the bounces is another way to cut down on render time. So that's if you're doing a still image. Let's see how quick this would be with the AI denoiser. So I just hit F12 to enter render mode. It's thinking up here. And I don't feel like waiting for that. So I'm going to X out. I don't need 4,000 samples, let's try 300. Now I'm gonna hit it again, function 12. We timed out at 20 seconds last time because I didn't feel like waiting for it. Already, we've got half the scene done, more than half the scene in half the time. So I reduced my resolution. And look at that, where I stopped it, it's already done. Okay. And that's a pretty good image. You know what I mean? Like there's no noise. So that's for doing a still image for doing animation. Click off 
denoise. I'll set that back to 0 0.1 just for the fun of it. Those are both turned off. And I'm going to change my max samples the air 300. Let's change that to 100. Uh, viewport, I don't need it to be that high. 300 will be that sample size fine. I'm going to turn off the noise threshold as well. This is for animation. I'm going to go back to my shader editor. Actually, I'm going to go to my compositor. In the new blender, compositor is right here. But in the old one, you gotta go up to the compositing tab up here. They both do the same thing. So I'm gonna go back to my layout. Layout is the world that I'm looking at. I'm gonna open up my compositor down here. I'm gonna click use nodes. And it always starts off with this. I've got render layers and the node strand goes through to my composite, okay? I wanna say, hey, I don't want that 3D render engine running. I mean, the, uh, I don't want the AI renderer. So I'm going to check right here, my stacks of paper. And I'm going to click on denoising data. You got to do that for doing the normal renderer. So I turned off the AI by clicking off the denoising here. I went to my stacks of paper and I clicked on denoising data. Okay. Now I'm going to add a denoise node. Shift A to add anything in Blender, whether it's an object, a light, or a node. Shift A. I'm going to click on search. And I'm going to type in denoise. It's right there. I drag it between the two of them. And remember, you want to go color to color. So I'm going to go denoising normal to normal, purple to purple, albedo to albedo, yellow to yellow. So this will work for animation. So if I hit function F12, before we were about 20 seconds with the AI render, this will be a lot slower, but you will not have the flickering. So at this point, you might reduce your sample count or fix your light bounces. But this is actually going pretty close. Uh, so see what it looks like. All right, that was seven seconds longer. Considering the AI render denoise is lightning fast, we got this pretty quick. So if this was 10 seconds, 24 frames long, 30 seconds a frame, that would be about, say, 60 frames at 30 seconds would be about, what, 20 minutes? Or, uh, you know what, wait, I'll use my calculator one second. Okay. Clear. So we got 30 seconds of frame times 60 frames is 3,000 seconds. So that's for one second would be 3,000 seconds, right? Because I did 30 seconds times six. Let's do that again, wait a second. So 24 frames per second times 10 seconds. So that's 240 times 30 7,200 seconds to render 10 seconds. So if I were to divide that by 60, that'd be 120 minutes, that'd be two hours. Two hours to render 10 seconds of animation. That's not half bad when you think about it. You know. And that's gonna be a good quality image. I mean, look at what that still is gonna look like. You've got your shading going back into the depths and where it meets the ground and your lighting and everything is as it should be. So, I mean, if you were to go into Eevee and try and make this look like this, you'd probably be at the same amount of time, plus all the headache you had to do to get Eevee to work like this.
Like you got to add light probes and things like that, and it's just such a headache. All right, so we'll finish up the rest of the lecture Wednesday.